So, in the last episode, I spoke about Oriental Despotism, and in the episode before that, I spoke about Modernization Theory in general. Now, you're probably going to want to go back and watch those if you haven't seen them yet, because in this episode, James Blout is going to utterly destroy those ideas. Hey, Cypher here. Now I can finally criticize Modernization Theory. As some of you may not be surprised to find out, it is unmitigated falsehood. The ideology behind it is rooted in racism and is pervasive among laymen, as in, like, non-historians. Every time you hear somebody spouting off about systematic conditions in a third world country, you can always catch vague hints of the whole oriental despotism thing in it. It is an excuse to spend little or no time on everywhere else other than Europe in history classes, as though they don't matter as much because they never modernized. Hence why so many world history classes used to look only at Europe. One historian really picked up on this whole problem. He was actually a geographer, but he made it his life's mission to expose this whole problem. His name is James Blout, and he is the one who made people really reconsider the whole racism built into modernization theory. Blout did this in his 1993 book called the colonizer's model of the world. And I'm just going to summarize it very quickly. You're going to see some text scrolling by the screen while I'm doing this. And this is actually a paper that I wrote for a class, so you'll see these little numbers in parentheses. They're referencing specific page numbers, which are called parenthetical citations. Blout seeks to destroy what he calls Eurocentric diffusionism, or simply modernization theory, as a plausible explanation of European dominance. The Eurocentrism part of that term is meant to point out how scholars seem to talk about nations peripheral to Europe as not having the ability to create the necessary institutions to establish a global hegemony. Diffusion was the explanation given by these theorists in order to explain why the periphery could have any modern inventions or institutions. To the Eurocentric diffusionists, anything modern was created in Europe and diffused outwards, but never the other way around. For Blout, these diffusionists are very incorrect and rely on what he calls the European miracle. This is the mythical special status of Europe as the breeding ground for modernity. He lists off several key arguments made in favor of this myth, and then makes a succinct argument against their more reasonable invocations, as opposed to committing the straw man fallacy. First is the biological argument, which takes the inherent miracle as coming from a genetic disposition, or an ability to control the population better. Then there are the environmental explanations, which argue that it is too hot in the tropics, the Orient is too arid, and there is better weather in Europe. Some argue for the creation of rationalism, such as Weber's religious ideology and the illogical foundations of the periphery. Technological superiority is argued, but must be given by some sort of special inventiveness in Europe. Finally, there are societal mythmakers, who argue that the Orient was inherently despotic by government structure. Church and class types within Europe allow for change, and family structure prevented Malthusian plights. As he describes each argument, he also lambasts it as either factually incorrect considering the rest of the world at the time, or simply racist. The former, being the more powerful argument in academia, requires something special to be present in Europe before 1492, which he denies. The problem of Europe's special status before 1492 is challenged by Blout. Those of a Marxist background especially rely on the idea that feudalism is unique to Europe, though Japan is often given exception. Blout fervently denies this assertion by showing that the feudal structure of Europe was not significantly different from that of the periphery, at least not enough to assert global hegemony. Another significant argument that he refutes here is that mercantilism, or simply proto-capitalism, was exclusively European. In this regard, the periphery was quite often far more mercantile in areas like Central Asia and the Gold Coast. 
he asserts here that Europe was in no way special prior to 1492. Since Blount could not only denigrate the modernists, he proposed his own theory, saying that the turning point for Europe was when Columbus discovered the New World. He shows that there had been major exploration missions emanating from the periphery prior to 1492. Simply nothing was able to find the New World. What allowed Europe to find the New World first was the major trade wind's favorable position, which when taken from the Iberian Peninsula, as Columbus and most subsequent explorers did, the transatlantic passage was made easier. The smaller population of the New World could not cope with the new pathogens transmitted by Europeans. Colonial enterprise in the New World through mining and plantations enriched Europe. The additional inflow initiated more accumulation, leading to modern capitalism and the vaunted global hegemony of Europe. The challenge from Blout is hard to overcome for modernization theory. They are the Eurocentric diffusionists he is railing against. The theories that praise Europe for its creation of capitalism and modernity, for good or bad, must create more robust theoretical foundations to countermand this criticism. Hopefully that wasn't too erudite. This is a very complex problem in the history profession. Personally, I don't think anybody's come up with an adequate answer to why the West is strong. Blount's answer is problematic in and of itself, and I'm sure some of you are already starting to pick holes in it. But really, his contribution was in destroying modernization theory. He died in the year 2000, but he left a book to be published posthumously called Eight Eurocentric Historians and that book has made a huge splash as well. Both of these shook up the history profession, but I'll leave out the 8 Eurocentric Historians book for anyone who wants to look it up. So tell me what you think about all of this in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and check out some previous episodes while you're at it. I'll see you next time.